Okay, for these problems, it's really about making sure that you're showing all of your work because it's really nice, the fact that our calculator will do everything for us. And if you get to college and you take like a statistics college in class, you probably won't even be using your calculator, you'll be using computer programs. Um, there's a whole bunch of them that'll do that for you. So it's not, not so much about can you get the right T star? Can you get the right P values? But do you know where these numbers are coming from? And do you know in statistics, it's really the, the assumptions and conditions that play a much harder and larger role than anything else. And you're going to see that today when we switch gears to the next chapter. All right, so first thing that we've got here, it says test an appropriate hypothesis and state your conclusion. Now, the way that I do my work, just so you know, I do this so you can see both of them. I don't, I don't care if you do both of them or not. Actually, I prefer if you only picked one. These are just the two that I normally go with. The histograms, to me, aren't always the most trustworthy, simply because it's all about how you select your bin width. And if you just do zoom stat versus changing it up a little bit, you never know if it's going to look completely different. I like the NPP. Um, the box and whiskers are also pretty good, because with the box and whisker, you can tell pretty quickly if you have outliers or not. And you can see kind of whether or not there's a skew going on. But what I do first is I go through and I kind of like I pull all of my data and I write all of that down. Did you write down, for example, your Y or X bar, however you chose to write it, your S, your N, did you make all of that stuff clear? Because you have to write that down. When it's not given to you, you have to record it. Everybody clear on that? When you're given data, you've got to write that stuff down because if there's a problem someplace else, I mean, Cameron, you had one number missing, uh, well, one digit missing, missing for one number, and everything exploded, right? looked really weird. This is the only way I can tell if that's where your problem came from. Okay? Then when we're looking at our conditions, oh, and make sure that you identify um, what your groups are. If you're using numbers like 1 and 2 or A and B, something where it's not kind of like basically understood, I probably don't need to describe the fact that D is dance and T is top 200. It's kind of understood. But if you're using something else, please put it there. So you have to talk about the fact that in this, both samples were from random samples. If it states random, state that in your assumptions and conditions. Don't go back and say, I hope it's representative. Ah, we've got random. We're good with that. So we have random samples. Um, the beats per minute between the dance in the top 200, those should be independent. And right now, that idea of independent groups is the most important condition of them all. Okay, because we are going to have a chance where, which is actually what we're going to be starting today, when your groups are not independent. Everything changes. But if you have independent groups, boom, we do it this way. Then we look at our um, less than 10%. Which isn't, um, with the top 200, you want to make sure that you're okay with that, because if I gave you 30 of the top 200 songs, would you be concerned? My sample size was 30 of the top 200. That's more than 10%. So in a situation where you know you have a limited group, please check that. Um, the histogram, if you're doing a histogram, like if you chose to do the first guy, histogram is universal and symmetric. If you're doing an NPP, you have to state that the NPP is nearly normal. Did you do that? Did you comment on either Instagram or your NPP? Look, because you need to do that. Don't just draw it, comment on it. And I like doing it this way because it's like, boom, I don't need to label it because everything is labeled. Do, 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 do. It's all there, I'm happy. And I'm very, very big on organization and I love graph paper. So both are nearly normal. I've identified my Statistic type thing, I'm talking about the average beats per minute of songs. If you just put BPM of songs, you've lost some. Okay, because those numbers, remember, we're looking at the sample, not the individual. So we've got our sampling distribution. Make sure you wrote T and not N. T distribution centered at zero for the hypothesis test. Your formula for standard error, make sure you got them little squares. Right here and here. And someplace, mine's all the way over there for some strange unknown reason. I want to see your degrees of freedom, 30.05. Do you have that written down someplace? 
please do not turn it into a scavenger hunt for me. Because if I don't find it, you don't get it. People threatening that to me in third block last class. I'm going to say, please look in the corner for your next clue. Look over here. Like, Dude, no, don't. Degrees of freedom can be found scribbled on desk number. No. Okay, no scavenger hunts. Make sure it's clear. For every single hypothesis test, what do you got to show? T-score. And what's really great about this, because I got all the junk listed out up here, boom, I'm just writing the formula. I'm going to be lazy and embrace the inner laziness. That's okay. As long as I show where it comes from. That's what our biggest concern here is. And our p-value, make sure you wrote your statement. Did you do this? Comparing your probability to the test statistic, alternative symbol, value. I did mine doing dance minus top 200. Dance minus top 200, my T star is negative and my alternative symbol is less than. If you did top 200 minus dance, I don't know what this is, but it's me dancing to the top 200, uh, then this sign would be flipped and that would be positive. But your, your P value would be the same. Good? Happy Monday. Yay. Waking up. Boo. So uh, I've got my hypotheses. Please make sure I still have some folks who are using the wrong notation here. This has to be mu, not y bar. Hypothesis test is trying to learn about what's true about the population, not about your sample. We know what's true about your sample. So conclusion with a p-value, blah, 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 greater than blah, blah, blah. We fail to reject the null. We do not have enough evidence to claim that there's a difference in average BPM between dance and top 200 songs. Yay, words. If you're going to be talking about um, using the words average and difference, you need to make sure that the word difference comes before the word average. Because chapter... 20, I know this is going to be like real painful when I say this. Chapter 23 is about the difference of averages. Chapter 24 is the average of differences. Yeah, exactly. The confused look. Okay. So he's like, wait, what? All right. And then our confidence interval. And I just wanted to kind of point that out to you that your confidence interval and your hypothesis test should always come to the same conclusion if yeah, well, the alpha and the confidence level match. So before I used a 0.05, and it absolutely matches with the 90% confidence level, so they should have the same conclusion. Yay, conditions met as before. What changes in my sampling distribution? The mean, because now we're centered at whatever I viewed the difference to be. And make sure you showed your T star. Did you show your T-star for your? Good. Yeah, make sure we've got that down there. Calculator spits it out. Make sure you've got your formula. Make sure you're identifying what kind of a thing we're doing here to sample T interval. So based on our sample, we're 90% confident the true average beats per minutes of dance songs is between 1.906 slower to 0.15 faster than the top 20 songs on average. How are we doing with this? Really wanted to focus on making sure that we had all of our notation, all of our little bits show. Questions? No? Okay, sweet. All right, so go ahead and clean. That didn't go too horribly, I hope. I'm so proud of myself that I finally fixed it so that I didn't hole punch right through all the numbers. Every year. No, I need to fix that. No, no, no. Okay. All right. Um, so chapter 23 was about comparing means, which meant that we started with this idea of two separate independent groups. And so we knew we had independent groups, so we looked at them separately. We took their averages separately, and then we compared those averages. Now, Chapter 24 is about paired samples and blocks. We do paired samples and blocks when we think that there is something that's kind of linking us together, that there might be things going on within it. So this, when we're talking about paired data, is kind of the exact opposite of what we had last time. 
last time, our really, really, really big assumption and condition that we needed to have was independent groups. Now we're saying, dude, what happens when those groups are not independent? Okay, so data is considered to be paired when it's collected in pairs or you know that there's some natural link between two observations. For example, if I'm looking for the average wear on a tire and I want to compare the front tire wear to the back tire wear, I'm going to compare it from the same car. I'm going to compare if I'm looking at age difference between husbands and wives. I'm going to compare within each couple. I'm not going to compare my parents' ages, like my dad's age, to your mom's age. That would be weird. Okay? Do you understand what I'm talking about? Things that are not independent. That's when they're going to be paired. You can pair in a lot of different ways. Uh, when we're doing an experiment, we can pair data. We call it blocking in an experiment. And if it's an observational study, we call it matching. It really doesn't matter. It's the same concept. We block in an experiment. We match in an observational study. And those are both um, things that we've seen before. And those come from before and afters. Kind of like if I want to do an experiment on um, resting heart rate. And I have half the people run a mile and then take a half hour break and then take their pulse rate versus I have that same group wake up from a nap and do their, their pulse rate and then have the exact opposite order done with a different group. If I've got before and after, if you've got somebody doing something with their left hand versus their right hand, if you've got somebody doing something that's taking caffeine and not taking caffeine, this is not taking caffeine, I promise. No, I lied. I did have some coffee this morning. I had a couple sips. It's okay. I know my limit. I've done experiments. But before and after is a really big one because what we're doing with before and after, if you're looking at the same individual, you're reducing the variability. You're looking at comparing that one person or that to itself. And when we have that type of a paired, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the pairwise data, which means instead of what we did in this last unit where we said, okay, I've got this group and I've got this group and I'm going to look at their averages and then I'm going to compare them because the groups are separate. Now I'm saying I've got this individual before and after, before and after, left and right, left and right, left and right, mom and dad, mom and dad, mom and dad, whatever my pair is, I'm going to find the difference first and then look at all the averages because it's the differences within each pair that I care about, not the two completely separate groups. Does that kind of make sense? It's like if I've got something tying them together, I want to be able to remove that variability. So I'm going to look at each difference versus looking at the two groups and say one group's average and the other's group's average. Because of this, this is what I was talking about at the very beginning, we have that kind of really annoying wording where it's average of differences or difference of averages. And if you kind of think about it, the second word is what you did first. I don't know if that makes any sense. Average of differences, what did you do first? Second word, differences. You did all of your subtraction first, and then you took the average. Difference of averages, what did you do first? You took the averages first, and then you subtracted. And what makes that a little bit tricky is that we've got to be very careful in our notation that we can decide what's going on here. So let's first start off with thinking, is this paired? Would I do independent groups or some kind of a linked group? So um, students taking an MCAT prep course, their before and after scores. Do you think paired or not paired? Paired, why? Before and after, it's the same student. If I were to care, compare one student's before scores to another student's after scores, that does not make sense. I'm only going to compare one student to themselves. Okay, what about 20 male and 20 female students in a class who take a midterm and we're comparing their scores? To pair or not to pair? It is the same test, um, but I, am I going to compare male number one to female number one? Or am I going to compare all the males 
to all of the females. So is that pair or not pair? Not pair. And that's what you've got to think about. If I were to look at 20 males and 20 females take a midterm and then they take a final, and I don't care about the males and the females, I can pair about that difference. That's something a little different. Uh, see, a group of college freshmen are asked about their quality of university, the quality of the university cafeteria. A year later, same students are asked. What do you think? To pair or not to pair? Pair? Why? Same people. If I did a random sample at the beginning of the year and then I did a random sample at the end of the year, to pair, not to pair. Not to pair. Do you see how important that random is in those independent groups? It's going to completely change which type of a test that we're going to be dealing with. All right. Uh, now, part of what we're doing here is going to go all the way back to when we were designing experiments and observational studies. Yay. So, this is what we're doing here. Number four. MTV. Okay, you guys don't work with your TV on anymore. You work with like TikTok or YouTube or some random stuff on in the background. Yeah, Hulu. Hulu. Netflix. That's me. Turn that TV on. I'm old though. So, what we're trying to decide here is if I'm going to design an experiment, what does it need to have? How can I design an experiment so it requires a two-sample T procedure? If I'm talking about a two-sample test, really what we're looking at here are our assumptions and conditions. For a two-sample test, what is the most important assumption condition? We just did this. Two-sample test. What did I tell you is the number one important assumption or condition? Independence of groups. Do you understand what I'm talking about here? To design a test, I need to look first at that main category. My main group here is independence of groups. So I want groups that are going to be independent. Um, so if I want to do this, anybody have an idea how I can have two groups that are independent? Figure out which study technique is better. Say it. Random sampling. Yes, you're going to have to have random sampling for what? I've got volunteers. Let's say I've got 40 volunteers. What am I going to do? Am I going to randomly select the 40 volunteers? No, why not, Ryan? They, they already volunteered. Problem with volunteers? They are volunteers. They're self-selected. So how do I get random into this? Randomly assign them to what? To Zemir Hermana, huh? To the controller of the experiment, what would the control group be? Okay, so what I'm looking at here is I've got my volunteers. Remember doing this? You guys remember this? Designing an experiment, we're randomly assigning them to two groups. Tell me what one of my groups are. A room with MTV and one without. So I've got with MTV and without MTV. What am I going to do? What am I measuring? What's my response variable? And it's t time. We're looking more like at time because either you have it or you don't. So for this one, we're going to say compare times. 
So I'm going to compare. Do I compare across these groups? Can I compare this group to this group? Did I do blocking? No. All I did was random assignment. So if I do random assignment, I can compare AIR or ARE. Yay, math. Compare. Am I going to take the average of the groups or am I going to find a difference between each pair? Groups. Compare. Average time. So I have my subjects. I'm going to randomly assign them to two groups. Those are my treatments, my response variables, and what I'm doing with them. What kind of a design is that? Is that stratified, cluster, completely random, blocked, matched pairs? It's not blocked. What's the only thing I used? Random assignment. So what is this? This is completely random. Is that an experiment or an observational study? Experiment. Why is it experiment? Because we're changing stuff. We have control over these. Can I do cause and effect? Yes. Okay, we've got to pull all of this old stuff together. So that's what we're looking at here. You can use words, randomly assign half the volunteers to in a quiet room, the other half to the MTV, compare the average of the groups, or you can do it in a picture. I like the picture better because that's just me. Pictures don't always work, though. But does it make sense what I just went through there and did? Okay, so now I'm going to take the same idea, but I'm going to do it as a matched pairs design. So I'm going to do the same idea. I'm going to do a matched pairs design. So I'm going to start off with my volunteers again. What am I going to do with them? MTV. Good. But in order to get those two groups, what do I need? I need random assignment. And then for this one, let's say this first group you could do with MTV, then without. And then he said this group would be without MTV. Than with. And we would do it that way because some people, I need, I need a little warm up before whatever I do. If I'm going to be doing something multiple times, the first time always sucks. If I'm playing Sudoku over and over and over and over again, my times get better and better and better the more I practice. Okay? So, what am I going to do here? What am I going to compare? See, well, it's spelled right in one of them. I always want to do compare because you're pairing it, right? Compare. Stupid. So we're going to compare. Am I going to do average of this group, average of this group, and then do the difference? We're going to find the difference for each of these. And then we're going to compare the average. Compare the differences to find averages. So this one here is average of the differences, where this one here was the difference of the averages. I know, just completely and totally irritating. I wish there was a way around that. 
N this one is almost kind of nicer to do um, in words. But with something like this, you want to make sure that you're very, very careful. And when you look right here, subtract each volunteer's quiet time for his or her MTV time. That's going to be important that you spe um, specify that because if I do MTV with and minus without and I did without minus with, with what's, gonna, what's the problem with that? Yeah, your order is different. So if, if I'm always better without, then this guy is going to have a negative difference. That one's going to have a positive difference, and I can't necessarily compare it like that. Okay? So whenever you're doing this, you want to make sure that you always state, and for this one, the notation here is going to be the mean of after minus before. Whereas this one is the mean of after minus the mean of before. Do you have, see, see how subtle those differences are here? Because for this one, I find the averages, then I subtract. This one I subtract, then I find the averages. Okay, so of those two, which one do you think is a better design, something that would be more likely to get you a true answer as to which one's better, with or without MTB? Do you want to do A or do you want to do B? Who's going to be a better experiment? B? Why are you saying B? More complicated? Maybe. B is better, but why B? Anna? Right. What do, is there, there's a way of saying that. What are we reducing when we're looking at B? You're reducing your variability. Because on A, what happens if I get more of the good people in the group with MTV and more of the bad people in the group without? That's going to be very difficult to kind of talk about the individual person's ability and how it affects your outcomes. But if I look at B, because I'm comparing one individual against themselves, you're reducing that variability, which is going to make it for a stronger design. Does that make sense what we're talking about here? Today I really want to focus on the main difference between differences and difference of averages. And it really it comes down to our assumptions and conditions. This is the big spot. And it really is, am I going to average first and then subtract? Or am I going to subtract first and then average? And it comes down to whether they are independent groups or whether it's paired data. For the two sample, they were independent groups. For this guy, the data has to be paired. And what's really cool about this is we start off with this idea that if I have paired data, we basically, it's like if I gave you a list one and a list two, you find the difference in list three, and then you just do a one sample test on that. It's kind of nice how it works out. So when we're talking about independence for this, it's each pair is independent. So it's like Carissa's scores are independent of Sam's scores, which are independent of Ryan's scores, which are independent of Jackson's scores. Each pair of before and after, quiz and test, however you want to compare it, each pair is independent. But within those pairs, you have that commonality, that linkage. You still need to have some randomization. If you don't have randomization, you can't do anything. You, that randomization helps us kind of reduce some of our bias and allows us to kind of push the data on to a larger group. 10% condition, again, for means, we normally don't freak out unless we happen to know that we have a very limited sample. So that idea, if I'm taking the top 200 songs, I can't take more than 20 of them. Okay? And we still have the normal population assumption. It's just for this, we're not doing the NPP or histogram on two groups. We're actually going to be doing it once, and that's going to be on the differences. So we're going to go through and do all of our subtractions and then just do the histogram or the NPP or the box plot, whatever you want, 
on those differences. Okay, so today we're just kind of like pulling these pieces apart a little bit. And we'll actually do this next class. So the paired t-test, this is the big thing I want you to notice. We're looking at the mean of the differences. So instead of mean 1 minus mean 2, it's just mean of the differences. The t-score, hey, look at this. Observed minus expected over standard error. And this guy here just looks like a one sample test because basically it is. It's just our one sample. We've gone through and we've done the subtractions already. And our degrees of freedom for this is just n minus 1, the number of pairs minus 1. So I'm just going to kind of flip through this real quick. All of these things are posted. The confidence interval is going to be the exact same thing as before. Observed plus or minus test statistic times standard error. Degrees of freedom is n minus 1. Okay? That's basically all we're looking at here. All right? You do have a homework. It's going to be due on March 8th. Your quiz is going to be March 9th. And your test is going to be March 13th. Friday the 13th. Oh, I'm not going to be then you're going to need to arrange. What are we all doing? 